and get started. Um, my name is Marcus Noland. I'm the Executive Vice President and Director of Studies here at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. And it's my uh, great uh, pleasure to welcome you to this uh, event we're hosting this afternoon of the Washington rollout of the Pew Research's uh, latest global trade survey. You know, it's traditional to say, you know, we're, we're very happy that you're all here. Uh, this afternoon, it's uh, a particular, uh, uh, particularly gratifying to have you here because, as you know, as, as I'm sure you're well aware, there are other things you could be doing with your time at this particular moment here in Washington, D.C., and the fact that you've chose to spend it with us, uh, we do indeed appreciate. And we think that we have a program that will uh, justify your investment in time with us. We have uh, three speakers this afternoon. The first is Bruce Stokes of the Pew Research Center. I have known Bruce for a very long time. I was trying to figure that out this morning, exactly how long I've known Bruce. The, I think all I can say is, when I met Bruce, I still had hair. Um, Bruce was a very successful journalist and then moved over to Pew, uh, the Pew Research Center, where he has been leading their efforts on statistical analyses of, uh, and, and surveying of trade and globalization. These surveys are fascinating, uh, both the ones done globally as well as the ones focusing uh, here on the United States. And uh, not only are they fascinating, they're, they're, it's material that I've actually used in my professional work, and um, I, I find it very interesting, very useful, and I'm sure you will as well. Uh, we don't just give you Bruce, but we have two very good discussants as well. We have um, the new, or the newish, I suppose, uh, president of the Economic Policy Institute, Thea Lee. Uh, before uh, uh, assuming that position at EPI, she worked in a number of positions at the AFL-CIO, where uh, most uh, recently she was Deputy Chief of Staff to President uh, Rich Trumpka, and in that capacity uh, uh, supported uh, President Trumpka when he has uh, participated in a number of programs here at the Institute as well. Before that, she was, as we were discussing over the lunch table, she was at EPI, so it's sort of the prodigal daughter returns. Finally, we have uh, Ambassador David O'Sullivan, uh, who is the European Union's ambassador to the United States. Prior to his appointment, he has uh, held a number of senior positions um, within the uh, European Commission, uh, but perhaps most, um, most uh, relevant or salient for today's program, he was Director General of Trade between 2005 and 2010 and was Chief Negotiator of the Doha Round. Maybe he can tell us when uh, that's going to come to a conclusion. Um, anyway, with that, I will turn it over to Bruce, who will be followed by Thea and Ambassador Sullivan, and then we'll all come up here to the stage and uh, we'll have a, a period of open discussion. Bruce, my pleasure. Thanks, Mark, and it's really a, a great pleasure and a privilege to be here, and uh, great to see some old uh, friends in the audience, and I'd uh, like to thank Mark and, and Adam Posen, who couldn't be with us, uh, for inviting me. Uh, we presented these results the last time we did this global survey in 2014, so it's nice to uh, do that again and get an update on how the publics around the world are feeling about trade. But before I start, I'd like to also uh, thank Fred Bergston for creating Peterson because I remember in the 1970s uh, going out to lunch with Fred and he had this, he said, I have this idea, I'm going to do this think tank, you know, what do you think? And I remember thinking it was a great idea, I also wasn't so sure he would be able to pull it off. And I would say that after all these years, the Peterson Institute has certainly become um, one of the premier uh, economics think tanks in the world. But I will tell you, my lone piece of advice to him was, Fred, be sure you serve really good meals at lunch. And I would say that Fred took my advice because the meals are really always great here, so thank you. And thank you all for showing up, hopefully not just for the food. Um, why should we look at trade and public attitudes towards trade? I think the short answer is because we all know that people vote. And... Um, Trade is a political issue in this country in a way I would say it has never been in my lifetime, even at the 
the depths of the Japan trade wars, uh, trade was not nearly as salient as an issue as it is today. Uh, so I think it's very important we try to understand not only how people in the United States feel about trade, but also how that compares with how people feel around the world. Uh, a couple of caveats. Uh, one is um, I, I will show you some survey results. It really does depend on how the question is asked. Uh, and you as consumers of trade uh, or any uh, public opinion polling should look at questions. Uh, when you get a principled question, you tend to get a principled answer. When you get a more nuanced question, you get a more nuanced answer. That's one of the things I think we all need to remember as we look at this data. Um, also, we, I think we have to acknowledge we don't know what respondents were thinking when they gave us the answer. And I think the question that we all tend to have when we look at public opinion polling is, well, why did they think that? Well, you know, frankly, we don't know why they thought that. They probably didn't know why they thought that because what we're evoking here are emotions, not reason. Um, the best public opinion questions are ones that evoke emotion because people vote on emotion. People vote in the marketplace when they go buy a car. They buy a red car rather than a blue car, even though it's the same car under the hood. And we celebrate that as the market economy at its best. We have to understand that public opinion is similar, that what we want to know is how people feel about something. Because frankly, even though all of you may lay awake nights trying to decide whether trade creates jobs or is it technology that destroys jobs, the average person doesn't do that on a daily basis. They have a feeling about these things, and I think that's what we're trying uh, to evoke. Um, we also need to remember that while people all over the world have an opinion about trade, and I'll show you that the don't knows are actually pretty low, in the United States we know for certain that it's not a priority, despite the fact that it's more of a political issue today than maybe ever before. We just released a survey yesterday 57% of Democrats said it was a very important issue as they thought about how they were going to vote in November. 55% of Republicans said it was a very important issue. That sounds like a lot, except there were 12 other issues that were more important than that. So again, you need to put it in context. People have an opinion about trade. It's a very political issue right now, but it's not necessarily the determinative issue in terms of how people are going to um, to vote. Uh, the headlines of this survey are, uh, I think, very straightforward. Publics basically all over the world think that trade's good for their country. But when you ask them about more specific things that are more personal, in many countries, people don't believe it's good for them. They don't think it creates jobs. They don't think it raises their wages. And I hate to break it to economists, they don't believe that trade lowers prices. Other than that, we'll get into the survey. Um, well, let's see. Maybe we will and maybe we won't. <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. It wasn't turned on. That'll do it. Um, and it's still not turned on. <laughs> Come back. <laughs> Come back. It's not, still not working. Still not working. Okay. Okay. It, it, it's counterintuitive. Yeah, it's counterintuitive, right. Forward. Okay, down is forward. Okay. This was tw done in 27 countries with 30,000 respondents by telephone and face-to-face, -face and face-to-face -face in emerging markets for the most part, uh, telephone in most advanced economies. The overview is, first we have to see the economic context because how people feel about the economy is very determinative of how they feel about trade. As you can see, uh, people feel much better about the economy than they did at the depths of the, of the Great Recession. Uh, and it's, it's across the board in advanced and emerging markets. Uh, in the US, the EU, and Japan, people feel better about their economy today than they have at any time since 2002 when we first asked this question. So that's terribly important to keep in mind. Um, when we ask people if trade is good for their country, Three quarters of Americans say trade's good for the country. Uh, that's less than people in other advanced economies. It's less than people in emerging markets. 
But three quarters of the American people saying that something is good is a pretty strong number. But when you drop down to a more specific question, does it create jobs? Only about a third of Americans say it creates jobs, whereas over half of people in emerging markets say trade creates jobs. Does it increase wages? Um, less than a third of Americans say that, whereas almost half of people in emerging markets believe trade increases wages. Let's be clear about this. In many of these emerging markets, that's exactly what has happened. There are more jobs because of globalization, and there are higher wages because of globalization. And it's probably not surprising that the public recognizes that. Now, the last question is, does trade increase or decrease prices? As, of course, all of you know who've studied your economics, it, politicians tell us that trade creates jobs and raises wages. Economists don't tell us that. Economists say nations should trade because it lowers prices. As you can see, the median findings across the world are nobody believes that. Uh, to give you a sense of the impact of at economic attitudes on uh, people's attitudes towards trade, among those people who say their, their economy is doing well, 53% of those people say that trade creates jobs. Among those people who say their economy is doing well, 39% say it increases wages. Those are both higher than the percentages we found among people who say their economy is doing poorly. So clearly, there is some correlation here between how you feel about the economy and how you feel about uh, wages and jobs and their relationship to trade. Um, we asked the American public, is trade and our business ties good or bad for the country? Uh, we've been asking that since 2002. And as you can see, that uh, a majority of Americans consistently say trade's good for the country, that's the red line, but this is lower than the median for other advanced economies that we ask that same question. So we are relatively less supportive, but still pretty strongly supportive. Uh, what is interesting on that question is that it really depends on who's in the White House. If my guy's in the White House, I think trade's good for the country, and if my guy's not in the White House, I think my trade's not good for the country. Um, this is a more nuanced question. Uh, the Pew uh, Research Center's uh, domestic polling operation has been asking this question for years now, and it's about trade agreements. And stop and think about that for a minute. It is, you're asking people, do you want your government to negotiate further opening of the U.S. market and increased competition in the domestic market from foreign goods? You still get, in many cases, and certainly recently, a majority of Americans say these things are good, but consistently throughout time, the percentage of people who believe trade agreements is good for the country is lower than the percentage who believe trade in principle is good for the country. So I like to say that, you know, American people have, you know, they've drunk the Kool-Aid on trade and globalization. Yeah, I think maybe it's good for the country. I'm not so sure that my government further increasing the domestic competition is good for the country, although still a majority of Americans believe that. So that's where you begin to see some differentiation depending on the wording of the question. Uh, these are the comparison of the 2014 to 2018 results on some of these questions. As you can see, the percentage of Americans who say trade creates jobs has gone up 16 percentage points. Uh, the percentage of Americans who say trade increases wages has gone up uh, 14 percentage points. So people are slightly more likely to say that trade creates jobs or raises wages. There's really no change in terms of how they feel about trade and prices. But nevertheless, you still have far less than half of the public believe that trade creates jobs, raises wages, or decreases prices. Uh, briefly, if you look at the uh, demographic breakdown in the United States, as you can see, uh, the change, and this is, this is the bad side. In other words, does trade, uh, is trade bad for the country? Uh, actually, the percentage of people across the demographic spectrum say ha has decried, declined to say trade's bad for the country. Uh, does this, this is the question of the side of the question that says, does trade destroy jobs? Uh, as you can see, that's gone down across the spectrum of uh, uh, people, gone down roughly the same among Democrats and Republicans, uh, gone down s by 21 percentage points among people who, over the age of 50 gone down only 13 percentage points among people under the age of 29. Uh, so there's some age difference there. 
This is about the decrease of wages, and I'm showing you the negative because that's where the political fight is. The, the political fight is around whether trade destroys jobs or, or lowers wages. And as you can see, um, the percentage of young people who believe that trade lowers wages has gone sig down significantly, 18 percentage points. Um, and it's down, gone down 16 percentage points among older people. So you do see a cross the board uh, change here. It's gone down very strongly among whites, not so much among blacks and Hispanics. Uh, in fact, those aren't even statistically significant changes. Uh, we ask uh, these questions in, as I said, 27 countries, including Canada and Mexico. What I find interesting here is that while everybody in NAFTA thinks trade in principle is good for the country, the Canadians are far more likely to say that than the Americans by 15 percentage points. There's not a whole lot of difference uh, between uh, some of these other categories. Certainly, Canadians are uh, far more likely to say that trade creates jobs than are Americans by uh, 11 percentage points. So there is some difference on that issue. Certainly not a whole lot of difference between Americans and Mexicans on these issues. Um, how do Europeans uh, feel about these same questions? Uh, Europeans are slightly more likely to say that trade creates jobs, slightly more likely to say it increases wages, uh, no, slightly less likely than Americans to say it increases wages, um, and slightly less likely to say that trade decreases prices, although, again, small minorities uh, in most cases in Europe believe that. Um, this is the breakdown of these questions by European country. I think what jumps out at you in this number are the Italian numbers. The Italians in 2014 and again this year are the least likely to believe that trade is creating jobs or raising wages or lowering prices. Uh, and the difference between Italian attitudes and the rest of Europe are huge. Uh, now, I will tell you that the Italian attitudes have actually gone up a little bit, <laughs> but uh, those aren't numbers to write home about, certainly. Um, this is the broader picture globally in emerging markets. Uh, basically, you get um, uh, fairly strong support and majority support in most of the emerging markets we surveyed in uh, that say trade creates jobs, although certainly not the case in Mexico, where only about a third of the public believes that. Uh, you have a smaller median in advanced economies and more divisions in advanced economies in terms of trade and uh, job creation with Argentinians and uh, Italians, uh, a majority of both, or half really of both, saying it is, uh, uh, they, they are more likely to uh, destroy jobs. Um, this is how the view on jobs and trade have changed over time gone up dramatically in the U.S., gone up dramatically in Poland. Remember, the Polish economy is doing, doing very well over the last few years. Um, gone down very dramatically in Tunisia, Argentina, uh, Brazil as well. But again, those economies have done very poorly in the last four years. Trade and wages, again, advanced economies are divided over trade's impact on wages. Uh, only 31 percent, a median of 31 percent in the advanced economy say uh, trade increases wages. Notice that the Koreans and the Poles are very confident that trade increases wages, whereas the Italians, again, the French as well, the Greeks and the Argentines are actually not very confident. Um, by two to one in emerging markets, uh, people say that trade boosts wages, so there's a very strong belief in that. Not Again, not in Mexico, though, not in Brazil. Um, in terms of how uh, public attitudes on trade and wages have changed over time, again, Poland, the U.S., gone up dramatically. Again, those are countries that have experienced pretty strong growth recently, uh, gone down dramatically, again, in Argentina, Tunisia. Trade and prices... Um, basically, in only one country, um, uh, well, actually two countries, Israel and Sweden, do publics believe, a majority of the public believe, that trade lowers prices. I can tell you in uh, 2014, 
It was only the Israelis who believed the trade lords, but we didn't survey in Sweden that year, so I can't tell you what the Swedish attitude. But the point is that, um, for the most part, it's not a proposition that most publics accept, uh, despite uh, what economists say. Um, emerging markets are uh, very convinced that trade increases prices. Um, now, on this issue of prices, I can tell you a, a cautionary note. We have asked people periodically about inflation in their country. Um, it would suggest that people believe inflation is there when it's not even there. In 2013, for example, in the United States, the inflation rate was 1.5%. At that point, 50-some uh, percent of the American public said inflation was a very bad problem in the United States, and 80-some percent said it was a very bad or somewhat bad problem in the United States. So there is a disconnect between the underlying inflationary data and people's views of what's actually happening to prices in their country. And I think you, you may see it here, too. I mean, it may help explain why people don't think trade lowers prices. It may be that they think that trade, that prices are just simply inflexible downward, that they always go up for whatever reason. Now, we don't know that, but I think some of their attitudes about inflation where it doesn't exist might, might suggest that. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, among better educated people, uh, you get uh, a greater uh, acceptance that trade decreases prices. And those, those uh, differences are statistically significant. Uh, in the US, it's a 17 percentage point difference. Um, so that's the, uh, the overall view of this survey. I look forward to your questions and the comments of our commentators. And we'll uh, have a good discussion. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to participate in this conversation today, to uh, Marcus, to Fred Bergston, to Adam Posen, who couldn't be here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about this important work with uh, Ambassador O'Sullivan, with Bruce, with Marcus, and with all of you. It is certainly an interesting and maybe precarious moment for trade policy in the United States. And it's wonderful to have the data that Pew has put together, they do every couple of years, on Americans' attitudes towards trade over time and uh, in perspective with other countries around the world. But I have to confess to a little bit of frustration when I review polling results on trade. And I know Bruce uh, mentioned a lot of disclaimers about what a poll can and can't show and the limitations of what the questions are. But I've been in this world, the trade and globalization world, for over 25 years now. And um, like many of you, I've seen the polls come and go, and I've seen the questions asked in different ways and the different kinds of results. Um, and you know, my job has been to represent the labor perspective in the trade policy debate, first at EPI and then at the AFL-CIO. And I was a, a cleared advisor for 20 years. And so I was in the room with the State Department and USTR and the Congress in some ways, I would say I lived in the sausage factory. And people talk about you know, the, the, the making of trade policy, and that is, and I see uh, Ambassador Wayne over there too, he was in the sausage factory too, but watching the negotiation of the specific words on, let's say, the labor and environment clauses, or the um, rules of origin, or the investor state dispute settlement, each of those things are, uh, you know, is where the, the trade policy gets hammered out in those, um, those back rooms. And my perspective is to have watched over those years the disproportionate influence of multinational corporations on the making of trade policy and what the outcome has been. And so particularly when I was reviewing this study, a lot of these questions about not whether trade is good or bad, but how we do trade policy and who it benefits. And I think that maybe gives some insight into some of the paradoxes or the seeming paradoxes that the study found. So some of these, the paradoxes that are presented, I saw maybe three important ones. The first is, of course, what Bruce presented. Trade is good, or people think trade is good, but there is deep skepticism 
about the, the normal benefits of trade, job creation, higher wages, lower prices. And I'm going to talk mostly about that. The second is trade is good, but actual free trade agreements, especially in the United States, are more problematic. Uh, there's an 18 percentage point gap between people say trade is good and the actual trade agreements. And so I think that does raise another set of issues, which is maybe we're not doing trade right. That it isn't trade itself which is objectionable or good, but it is the, uh, the actual content and the uh, subsequent outcome of the agreements. And the third paradox is, well, it's not a paradox really, but the third big piece is when the economy is booming or healthy, and when your party is in the presidency, trade looks better. And that, that one is more uh, what might be expected. I think that's an intuitive outcome. But I think one of the questions that it raises is also, uh, maybe that's true for all sorts of economic factors. And this particular study focuses on trade. So if you ask people when the economy is healthy, do you think you know, infrastructure spending or tax cuts are good, they're probably more likely to say that as well. So it's. Um, it, it's an important question about what it is we're picking up. So a few things I wanted to say about trade is good, but the mixed results about what the effect might be on jobs, wages, and prices. And the first thing is, and I've said this probably at this podium uh, several times in the past, is that after 25 years in this world, I've never met a serious trade critic who thought trade was bad or who thought we shouldn't trade with other countries. And so the, the actual details of all the trade, the trade debate that we've had in Washington or around the country is about a couple of other things. It is about the rules of trade, what's contained in our trade deals and, our <clears throat> and what happens at the WTO. The second is which countries are singled out and rewarded with free trade agreements or better access to the US market. The third is which sectors are opened, how fast, and which remain protected. Because we all know that free trade isn't free trade. It's managed trade and investment, as I think um, we always used to say around the NAFTA debate. But for example, if you look at apparel, the market for apparel versus the market for medical services, uh, we have free trade in apparel, not so much with medical services. And so you know, we protect certain sectors and we don't protect others. The same question about labor rights versus copyright or um, patent protection. And we have chapters on both of those in our trade agreements, but they are of different levels of um, intensity. So that, that I think, is an important question to, to look at when we look at the, these findings. But even when we grant all that, th there's another question, and I think it underlies the Pew uh, study, which is, are people idiots? Um, is this about people just being not smart enough to understand that trade is actually good for them when they think it's bad for them? Is it that they all flunked Econ 101, or they never enrolled for Econ 101, they weren't lucky enough to take Econ 101? And I would I just want to give you a couple of things to sort of hang your hat on to think about in the context of this particular question. So the first one is trade lowers prices. That is the bedrock uh, finding uh, of free trade theory. But think about it in the real world in terms of somebody in Indonesia or somebody in Cincinnati answering this question on the poll. This does abstract from monopoly power and also from the massive rents that retail middlemen get. And so it is quite possible that for a lot of people, uh, that, though there may be benefits from trade and lowering prices, that a lot of that lower prices from international trade is sucked up by somebody else. Padding the profits or the advertising budget or the CEO pay of somebody else is getting a lot of those benefits from trade. Um, the, the second one. Trade creates jobs, and Bruce definitely alluded to this, that economists don't like to talk about the benefits of trade in that way, except when they're testifying before Congress uh, on a free trade agreement. But um, so many economists don't necessarily tout the benefits of trade as being around uh, aggregate job creation, but we definitely have that conversation, and you all know we've had that conversation in the context of pretty much every free trade agreement that's ever come before the US Congress. But it's also true that this abstracts from uh, capital flows, which are a big part of what happens in the wake of a free trade agreement, that trade agreements are not just about taking tariffs down to zero in two countries and having an increased flow of traded goods, but they're also about changing the conditions for outward investment or outsourcing uh, that, that is going to happen in the wake of a trade agreement. So for example, if you make 
outsourcing of production less risky, and therefore in the wake of NAFTA, for example, just hypothetically, if country, uh, companies choose to move production to Mexico rather than exporting to Mexico, that has a different kind of impact on the creation of jobs. Um, and that's motivated by, again, the content of the trade agreements. And the last one, trade raises wages. Um, so this one is the most complicated because a couple of things. And the first one is that trade theory doesn't actually predict that for a country like the United States, trade or lower trade barriers will raise wages. It predicts that uh, in a capital-intensive, skill-intensive country like the United States, opening up trade with countries that are more labor abundant uh, will likely lower wages for less skilled workers, that is workers without a college degree, about two-thirds of the U.S. workforce. And that's a, a debate we've been having for a while, so that's just one piece of it. But that, in some ways, um, I think actually connects back to the Pew outcome, too, which, as Bruce said, that the, um, the survey showed that there's a difference in belief between emerging countries and advanced countries, with the emerging countries being more likely to think that trade creates jobs and increases wages, and the advanced countries being less likely to think that. That actually does fit into the narrative. It's not the narrative we hear that often in Congress. But the other thing that I just think is important for all of us to keep in mind is that in the United States, we are at the tail end of 40 years of stagnating real wages for workers on the bottom two-thirds of the, the wage distribution. And so if trade is actually doing a really fabulous job raising wages, you can just imagine how awful it would have been without that trade. And I think that's hard for most people to, to think. And yet they can see from their own experience that in terms of the bargaining power of employers, particularly manufacturing employers, in terms of the conversation about how much uh, leverage workers have, that trade and globalization has often been used to undermine the bargaining power of workers. So I know uh, that's, I think, enough to get a lively conversation started, and I'm looking forward to your questions. But my last conclusion is just to say maybe, just maybe, we are sometimes asking the wrong question. And the question isn't, is trade good? But what kind of trade policy should we have? And how can we do a better job at using trade policy to address some of the social concerns that we all agree are important, like climate change, workers' rights, good jobs, inequality, and how can we have a unified conversation that will align our domestic policy choices on taxes, jobs, education, skills, and infrastructure with a different and better trade policy. So thank you, and I look forward to your questions. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh Marcus, thank you very much. Uh, uh, thanks to Fred of the Peterson Institute for putting this together, and Adam, who can't be with us, but uh, is with us in spirit, I know. Uh, uh, once again, to Bruce for an excellent presentation. I'd like to thank you, Bruce, for your commitment to this issue and the excellent work that Pew does with these surveys. And, and the, the great thing is they exist over time, so we have a kind of timeline, and it tells us how, how thoughts are evolving. I think we first met in a, in a conference room in Hong Kong in, in the... Uh, WTO uh, ministerial conference in 2005, uh, and you've been working this trade furrow ever since in different manifestations. Um, <clears throat> and I'd like to thank Thea as well because uh, she's been a great colleague in the AFL-CIO, and I'm delighted to see you returning to your, your roots. I want to take up your challenge, and you said, are people idiots? I was reminded by uh, uh, of, a, of a, an, uh, probably an apocryphal story about President de Gaulle, who was apparently looking out the, the window of the um, Elysee Palace when during the student manifestations in 1968, and his eye was caught by someone marching with a placard saying, more au con, which is, you know, death to idiots, uh, put politely. Uh, and the general apparently turned to one of his aides and said, ah, oh, a vast project, a vast project. So, <laughs> Uh, I don't know if that's true, but anyway, it's, it's always, I've, I've always thought it's a, it, it reflected at least something about General de Gaulle. Um, I, uh, I, I, I want to make a few comments on, on trade. It's, it's, it's a subject I find passionate uh, and at the same time sometimes frustrating because I, I, I tend to agree with Taya. At the end of the day, trade isn't good or bad. Trade is just trade. It, it, it is a, it's a tool. It, 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 we know the economic theory. I studied economics. I'm a sort of lapsed economist these days. Uh, and we know the only, I mean, I don't know if it's a science or if it's a dismal science, but it's the only l 
law of economics that I think is irrefutably true is the law of comparative advantage, which is that basically, even if a country could produce everything it needs, it actually makes more sense to focus on what you do best and to trade the rest, both in your own best interests and in the interests of your neighbors. And of course, we all have a vested interest also in the prosperity of our neighbors. So I think that's sort of irrefutably true. I think there are no examples, there are no autarkic success stories, there are temporary autarkic success stories, Japan a little bit, uh, South Korea a bit, I mean, Europe, uh, America had an infant industry in the 19th century, uh, some great intellectual property theft from Europe, uh, the early part of the 20th century, we've forgiven you for it, sort of, except for the geographical indications. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the, the, basically, we know that the road to prosperity lies to opening your markets and to trading. We know that. We know it's a fact of the wealth is created. However, and this is a very important however, the effects are not neutral. Uh, trade is a disruptor. It, it, it creates jobs, but it also destroys jobs. Uh, it creates wealth, but it also takes wealth away from certain sectors or certain regions. And the regions and sectors uh, where the jobs are created and where the wealth is won are not always the same regions and sectors as, the, as those that lose out from trading. And this is the creative uh, de destruction of Schumpeter. This is how it works. And to Tia's point, and I couldn't agree with this more, Ultimately, this is about domestic politics. It's, it's about how, what kind of society you want. How do you achieve social justice? What is the degree of state intervention to correct for these things? You know that trading creates more wealth, but the question is how, who gets that wealth? How is it distributed? And what is it used for? And these are policy choices each country gets to make. And I think that the debate about, well, is trade good or bad, is, is a little bit, a little bit, uh, uh, of a distortion of the debate, which is really about what are, what are the policies that a, any given country wants to have. It's not surprising to me that in Europe, perhaps people are a bit more, think more about trade or know more about trade. Geography has a lot to do with that. I mean, you can't drive for two hours in any direction almost in any European country without crossing a border. So we, 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 we have always traded uh, uh, within Europe. And of course, Europe probably invented trade as we know it uh, in, in the sense of the, the the modern trade across continents. Uh, so I think people have always understood intuitively that this is a, a positive thing and something that brings, brings benefits. But it's also true, and I think this may also explain a little bit why trade is sometimes slightly more positively viewed in, in, the, in, in Europe than in the United States. We have more social safety nets. We have more corrective policies that help adjust some of the consequences, whether this is regional policies or social policies, uh, social welfare, healthcare, and so forth, uh, which explains a little bit why some of the cushioning is there. Now, sometimes you can then debate whether we haven't gone overboard on that and we actually lose out on some of the economic benefits, but that's a separate debate. I'm just saying that relative to the United States, we have more social infrastructure, which perhaps helps people deal with the transition. Um, and I think in, in that sense, it's been quite interesting that while the, the TTIP negotiations provoked a massive sort of outpouring of public protest uh, uh, in, in, in Europe, in fact, trade policy has been able to go forward very consistently and we've been still able to conclude very ambitious trade deals with Canada, with Mexico, with Japan. Uh, uh, and these trade deals are generally speaking accepted as being, as being positives. Um, However, the, the issue, and Tia mentioned this, and I think it is, a, it is an important bit. One of the things that used to frustrate me when I was a trade negotiator was that people wanted me to solve every problem in the world. I had the NGOs, and I had Greenpeace, and I had uh, um, uh, 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 Oxfam telling me that I was a colonial rapist trying to exploit the developing countries. I had the trade unions telling me that I was exploiting the workers by benefiting from uh, exporting l industry to low-wage countries. And I had companies telling me that I was driving them bankrupt because we were creating uh, unfair trading conditions. The fact is, you can't solve every problem. And, and, and then I add in the environmental and the, the sustainable development issues, and everyone looks to trade policy to solve all of these issues. And I'm, I'm not at all against the idea that trade policy needs to be hugely sensitive to these kind of issues. On the other hand, you don't solve them with trade policy. Trade policy is basically a good policy that does good trade deals that improve the, the conditions of trade. 
When I worked in a previous manifestation in Brussels, I worked on social policy. I was responsible for the Working Time Directive and for the Works Council Directive. Uh, in which capacity I was condemned by the Secretary General of the uh, Business Europe, uh, known by a different name back then, as the most dangerous man in Brussels, undermining the competitive of European industry. When I was Director General of Trade, of course I dealt a lot with industry because I thought if you want to do a good trade deal, you need to figure out what business actually needs and how that's going to work. And I was accused by the, 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 the NGOs and the trade union movement of being the most dangerous man in Brussels because I was trying to undermine uh, social justice. And I never saw personally any contradiction between these two things. I think if you want to do good trade deals, you have to know what business is, how business is going to react. If you want to fix a problem of social justice that emerges from that, either you don't do the trade deal, which is possible, or you find a corrective in your own system, which is that you find ways of, of, of spreading the money more evenly. One of the big tragedies of the Brexit vote was that many people were very unhappy with the, uh, what they saw as the downside of immigration. Uh, and I mean, intra-European immigration, the Poles, the Latvians, the Irish, and the others who have gone to the UK. All working, all contributing massively to the economy, paying taxes, paying social welfare benefits. Uh, but of course, there was overcrowding uh, in the hospitals, there was overcrowding in the schools, there was overcrowding in the doctor's waiting room, and people felt, my goodness, uh, these immigrants are taking, you know, taking our livelihood from us. Of course, the answer is, it was public policy not to invest more in schools, in, in, in the healthcare system, uh, and in public transport in order to uh, spread some of the benefits of the economic advantages which those immigrants brought. This is a political choice, uh, a very conscious political choice, which we all can make. So my only point is that I personally believe that trade is an unequivocal positive. You have to manage its political acceptability, which is why you can't open all sectors perfectly uh, uh, immediately at all times. So you have to have a staged approach and what, is, what works politically. Trade deals have to be win-win. You cannot expect to do a trade deal with a partner who doesn't also feel that they can sell it to their domestic constituency. But then you have to address the domestic, uh, con the domestic policy comp uh, consequences of the trade policy which you espouse, and if that is greater openness, which I believe it should be, then you need the social safety net, you need the regional development policies, you need the investment policies, uh, and you need the, 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 the social protection and the, the labor laws that provide certain rights and protections. Uh, and, and that is an indispensable accompaniment. And that's a domestic political debate in each of our countries, and we will answer it differently uh, on both sides of the Atlantic, certainly, and even within Europe we will answer it differently because we have certain common rules across Europe, but we're not going to perfectly harmonize all of these things. There are different choices. Ireland is a, is a highly deregulated economy compared to, say, uh, the Sc Scandinavia. Uh, that's a, a choice that the Irish have made relative to, to the Scandinavians. Uh, they both uh, coexist in the single market with free trade between them, uh, and they both make their own domestic choices as to how they want to manage their, their, their issues of social justice and, and redistribution. So uh, I thank Bruce for the, for the presentation. Uh, I thank uh, Tia for an excellent uh, 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 sort of expose of her thoughts, and I look forward to participating in the discussion. Thank you very much. I think we've been blessed with uh, three very interesting and distinct presentations. Um, we have a bit under a half an hour for discussion. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, uh, we have a roving mic in the front, uh, and then we have a standing mic uh, there in the middle of the aisle. And if you are in the back and you would like to ask a question, just come forward and stand there and, and I will recognize you. And if you're in the front, just raise your hands and uh, Jessica will go over. And we already have <laughs> two hands raised. Well, three. Okay. Um, I feel like an auctioneer. Uh, please, uh, this gentleman uh, in the blue tie, and please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, Chuck Levy with Cassidy Levy Kent. I found this to be actually one of the best discussions because of all three presentations interrelated. But uh, and let me start with Bruce. How did you define trade for the purpose of the survey? Uh, when you talk about wages, prices, jobs, you sort of think in traditional trade terms. Yet Thea and David actually pointed out 
trade negotiations have become much more. And where people, for example, in developing countries talking about you know, wages increased because it wasn't trade, but uh, they had a lot more foreign investment coming in and foreign investors might pay higher wages than the local companies. So first question is how do you define it? And second is Thea and David both pointed out that trade negotiations have now brought in a lot of issues that simply aren't comparative advantage issues, that aren't traditional trade issues. Uh, they are dealing with regulatory issues, labor issues, uh, environmental issues. And this goes to we're now having trade agreements that do impact on what kind of domestic policies you have and to what extent is that be going to be inter inter influencing uh, attitudes as you say, well, we like our safety standards, but now, you know, in some international agreement, we've lowered them. And so I, I, that's how I would like to say, how do you now gauge public opinion and all this since it's all merged into a fuzzy area? I think what we'll do is let's take a couple questions, a few questions together and then, and then answer them uh, as a group. And if your question is uh, directed to a specific individual, uh, please indicate as such. This gentleman here. Uh, hi, Fred Hochberg. Thea, um, the agreement that has been sketched out about Mexico um, seems to go a long way towards some of the criticisms of free trade agreements in terms of uh, content, uh, and spe uh, investor settlement, uh, dispute settlement, um, the higher wages have to be paid in order for those costs. So uh, nothing is perfect. <laughs> Um, but does that actually move in that enough in the right direction that makes something like that palatable? And Fred Bergston. Uh, Fred Bergston. Uh, uh, <laughs> two questions for Bruce on your survey. First, uh, you said that when you get your guy in the White House, you like trade more. But what about when the guy you get in the White House doesn't like trade, <laughs> and says very vocally he doesn't like trade, and particularly says he hates trade agreements. So how can it be that getting your guy in the White House when he doesn't like trade increases support for trade among Republicans? Doesn't compute. But secondly, there have been a lot of other surveys, and you know this, which have the opposite result from yours, which say that in the last two or three years, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Republican support for trade, public Republican support for trade, has plummeted. Mm -hmm. And Democrats, all of a sudden, are more supportive of trade than Republicans. And that's been a big decline. Now, on my part, that leads to a great suspicion about your industry, the polling industry. <laughs> <laughs> not, not because I believe they're inaccurately, but because of what you said about intent. What motivates? My reading is that because a Republican president comes in and trashes trade, the Republican electorate trashes trade. It's not the president following the electorate. It's the electorate following the president. When they hear their guy say trade is terrible, they say trade is terrible. So I don't believe the polls in the sense of showing some fundamental change in underlying attitudes. On the other hand, if they're going to bless what their guy says, well, then they'll support what he does, as seems to be the case so far. So it seems to me those are absolutely critical points in trying to figure out the domestic foundations for what we're now seeing. Please comment. OK, why don't we stop there? And I'll start with Bruce and then Thea and Ambassador Well, Sullivan Let me address uh, Fred's question first. Um, uh, yes, it is puzzling that if you ask people if trade and business ties are a good thing for the country, you now have Republicans saying that they are more likely to believe that than Democrats, when, in fact, when you ask them about trade agreements, they are less likely than Democrats to say that trade agreements are good for the country. E although the Republican percentage has gone up a little bit on that question as well. You know, we we don't know what the respondent's thinking when he a, when he answer, he or she answers the question. So I and I and I'm wary. George Gallup used to say, "You ask people a question, they give you an answer, and when you start to interpret their answer, you're projecting onto them what you think." But I think that what it could be is that people 
simply believe because their guy, in this case, Donald Trump, who is a critic of trade, is in the White House, somehow this will work out better than uh, it did in the past. That may explain it. Because your, your point, Fred, is right, that our survey, CNN, New York Times, Gallup, has shown now for a number of years that um, in the body politic, among the average people, it's self-identified Republicans who are the protectionists and it's self-identified Democrats who are the free traders. And the question is, is that because they've changed their views about trade compared to, say, the 1980s when we thought the opposite about the public? Or is it that the demographic mix of these two parties has changed over time? We know that, that the Democratic Party at the margin is increasingly made up of young people, minorities, and women. And on most trade-related questions, those people are more supportive of trade. Uh, it is true that women are more worried about job loss to trade than men in our survey. So that slightly questions that. But the point being, this may be about the demographic mix of the two parties, whereas the Republican Party is, I think, at the margin, increasingly a party of old white men like me. <laughs> and when you think about it, Oh, no, actually not. Those, like yeah, right. <laughs> those, those folks at the margin are probably more likely than not to have been the population that lost their job in manufacturing over the last 20 years. And so they may and, and experience stagnating wages for their entire adult lifetime. And uh, whether trade is the culprit of that or not, they know that that's how their life worked out for them, and they aren't happy about that. And and if somebody asks them, did trade do that to you, they may well say it, it's, it's trade. So it is complex. I agree with you. Um, the question about um, is um, what about the new trade issues that are being are, are impacting uh, 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 the, the discussion, the negotiations? Uh, I mean, the problem is the tension here between asking people questions that where they haven't actually made the connection and thought about it themselves first. I mean, we, we're, I think we're pretty clear that people have opinions about trade. But if you start to get into more detailed questions about, well, about the impact of trade agreements on the environment or about the impact of trade agreements on uh, domestic uh, regulation, I, I think that you're going to get or at least our fear is, that you're going to get much higher don't knows because people haven't really thought about that. And I think that the debate that we had in Europe about TTIP, it was a perfect example of that, where we might all agree that trade agreements, now that tariffs are close to zero in many situations, that future trade agreements about the integration of, of two economies have to be about what were previously domestic regulation only now they're not domestic anymore, they're global. They're, 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 they're um, where they, the system has friction and we're trying to re release that friction. My sense is, I can't prove this from our, our polling but because it's too hard to poll on, but certainly in conversations with the public, that often people say, well, what does that have to do with trade? You know, this is my domestic regulation. Why would this be on the table in a trade? And, the connection say, well, you know, you, trade's not going to go forward if we can't somehow harmonize these domestic regulations. And the perfect example is we did a survey during the TTIP negotiations in Germany and the U.S., and we asked people about European regulation and American regulation on four topics, auto safety, consumer product safety, I think it was another, food safety. And basically, it wasn't that Americans liked European standards more than Americans did. They said, well, yeah, about a third of the public said, oh, European standards would probably be fine, too. The Germans, overwhelmingly, more than nine to one, <laughs> said, only German regulations, thank you very much. <laughs> and, you know, when you get those kinds of results, let's be honest, this is not a rational response. This is an emotional response. And it was the kind of problem I think the trade negotiators, to get back to David's point, can't solve, right? I mean, this is, this is gut, this is visceral, and it's about sovereignty, as the Brexit negotiations were in part about with the UK, and it's about people's sense of 
the issues that affect their daily life in a way that they don't see as being about trade. But trade negotiations in the future will increasingly, I think, be about those. It, that's certainly the experience in the, in the TPP or the TTIP negotiations. Whew, uh, there's a lot on the table here. But uh, let me start with Chuck's uh, question about trade negotiations have incorporated many issues. And I think that also goes to a point that, that David O'Sullivan was talking about, about, you know, can, is, is it unfair to ask trade negotiators to fix all the ills of the world? And I do see it differently. And, and I, I think this did start with the NAFTA negotiations where, for the very first time, a trade agreement was used as a vehicle to address a lot of issues that um, mostly the business community had about moving production to Mexico and concern about the safety of intellectual property rights or the, uh, the fear that, their, that their investment would be regulated in a way they didn't want to be regulated by a future leftist Mexican government. And so that's why NAFTA was piled down with a lot of, um, a lot of things that had never been in a trade agreement before, like investor state, a really strong uh, intellectual property rights chapter, financial services, and so on. And, you know, you can say, like, they started it. Uh, <laughs> that, you know, once those things became in the trade deal, then I think it is absolutely legitimate to say, well, hold on a second. You know, if we're going to use trade agreements this way to basically, uh, and this is how I would put it, to auction off access to the U.S. consumer market in exchange for changes being made in the domestic regulatory structure of your trading partner. And the, all the changes that we're asking for are things that business needs to make them more comfortable moving production to that place. And so you can, I think, very legitimately say as almost a defensive measure, hold on, this is about the terms of competition, the terms of global competition, and what is a legitimate form of competition and what is not. And that's what trade law is. Trade law says, you know, it's not okay to subsidize your exports. That is an unfair trade practice. It's not okay to price below cost in order to, you know, uh, take over a market and then, you know, use that power badly. So you can also say, is it okay to, uh, you know, have low prices because you're using child slave labor or because you are busting unions or because you are dumping your toxic wastes into the ocean or into the, the atmosphere. And so those issues, I think, are, are very properly part of it. Does it get complicated? It does. And I think the whole question about sovereignty, um, Bruce, you, you put your finger on it, is an emotional question for sure, but it is not ridiculous. Because to the extent that we are becoming part of a global economy, the question is, are we becoming part of a global economy in a way which is conscious and we are deliberately saying, okay, we want to we give up certain parts of our regulatory power in order to be part of this global economy and we understand very well what parts of regulatory power we're giving up or what parts of our democratic decision-making power we are giving up. Or is it sort of happening behind back closed doors and we're going to find out in a couple of years Oh, we can't use our government procurement policies, or we can't, uh, you know, regulate the safety of uh, cigarette packages and so on. So I think that's what people object to. But uh, Fred, to your question, Fred Hochberg, to your question about the, the Mexico Agreement, I think the Mexico Agreement does begin to address a lot of issues that have been raised over many years. Uh, at the moment, we haven't really seen a lot of the details, and Canada's not part of that agreement, but uh, I think there's no question that it's going in the right direction, and that's all I would say now. Yeah, I mean, um, look, there are, there are trade deals and trade deals. I mean, if you take the the, the European uh, experience, the single market, which is the kind of biggest trade deal, if you like, that's ever been done between 28 sovereign countries to actually completely integrate our markets, uh, indeed, it has been absolutely indispensable to have uh, accompanying measures. So that's why we have uh, some social legislation, some basic standards. That's why we have environmental legislation. So we discover that as we try to completely integrate uh, the, the economies of the, of the now 28 member states, soon to be 27, uh, we needed uh, accompanying measures in order to guarantee people that certain standards were not being undercut or that certain social, social norms were going to be respected. And I, but of course, that's a degree of, of deep uh, integration, which you know, is not what is normally on offer in, in typical trade deals. And NAFTA stops well short of that. Uh, and I, I think what we've always favored on the European side has been international standards, is to try to promote uh, international labor standards, labor standards, international environmental standards, because I'm, I, we are not convinced that you can kind of impose these things in bilateral trade deals, even between two big players. Uh, it, it's, it's difficult to craft uh, language which is mutually acceptable. Uh, we would rather be able to, and that's what we've done in our trade deals, is to reference uh, 
uh, international standards and in many cases to push trading partners to ratify or to implement uh, those, those trading standards. We wouldn't have insisted on that in the case of TTIP with the US. Uh, child labor and other, other standards that haven't actually been ratified here, but we won't talk about that. Uh, but uh, we, we, uh, that's how we've tried to do it, because I think it, it is difficult to insert into bilateral trade deals language that really addresses the, these, these fundamental issues in a way that's, that's mutually acceptable. Because, of course, they are also seen, they is absolutely right, in terms of the, 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 the question of outsourcing, but these are also seen as an attempt when you talk, particularly if it's a developing country, they see it as a, an attempt by the developed country to hamper their competitiveness because they see this as trying to push up the cost of labor, therefore to make it less that, whereas they see that as their one big advantage in these trade deals is indeed that they probably have lower uh, standards in some areas or lower wages, uh, and, and they see that as their way of getting a foot up the, the, the prosperity ladder, which we climbed, you know, probably two generations before they did. So that's the, the delicacy of that debate, and, and it, it can sometimes be a very difficult debate uh, on, on both sides, because people are saying, actually, we want to encourage higher standards in your country, uh, so, for example, the issue of child labor or slave labor or prison labor or whatever, uh, and that they will say, yes, but, you know, by interfering too much, and I'm not saying anyone justifies slave labor, but, you know, interfering too much in our domestic regulation, you are actually trying to weaken our comparative advantage in, in, in how we would uh, progress along the, the prosperity uh, conveyor belt. But, David, if I could just say one quick thing uh, with respect to that, which is, I actually find in the trade debate it doesn't help to talk about countries as kind of a, a monolithic uh, view. And, and for that, that the AFLCA, one of my jobs was working with trade unions from other countries, including from developing countries. And so when you say they see it as a, you know, an infringement on their ability to, to offer low wages or to offer no unions or to offer something else, the unions or the worker activists in those countries often see it, not every time, but often see those kinds of protections as something which is actually very valuable, of helping to create some space for them to organize uh, without being crushed. I agree. So, they. so M Mary Lovely, uh, my colleague here at Peterson, um, wisely chose to sit down <laughs> rather than stand there at the mic for the last 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. So Mary, please ask your question. Okay, thank you. My name is Mary Lovely. I'm a professor of economics at Syracuse University and a non-resident fellow here at the Institute, a colleague of Mark's. Uh, first, I want to say how much I enjoyed the presentations and, and the discussion that follows. I find it to be quite uh, inspiring and interesting. Um, I want to side with uh, Thea on one thing, which is that trade uh, changes relative prices. She, met, she pointed out that since 1949, Stouffer Samuelson, we've known that actually it changes relative factor prices. On the and in the same vein, it changes relative product prices. So I was a little dismayed to hear that de Gaulle uh, thought there were a lot of idiots among the French population. I hope that's not true anymore. But the United States, where half and half people said, it, prices go up, prices go down, may actually be showing their intelligence because, in fact, prices of exportables should go up and prices of import uh, competing and import competing sectors should go down. So if we ask the soybean farmers right now, would trade raise your prices, the answer is clearly yes. So I don't think that's as much as a, of, a, of a paradox as we might think. Maybe I'm reading too much uh, into their statements, but I think it's equally bad to uh, not understand that Americans do understand if they're in the export sector that trade is good for them. Um, so that's my comment. My question really is, we are embarking on a huge experiment in, in re-tariffying. I feel confident using that word since our president has now made using tariff as a verb okay. So we're <laughs> re-tariffying our, our economy. And I wonder, Bruce, are there any plans for Pew to at least, I know you are worried about going into the weeds on other uh, mechanisms that are embodied in trade agreements. But I think at least we should begin to think about tariffs. People have now are beginning to have a lot of experience with yeah. tariffs. We also saw this morning that Glencore, which is a Swiss company, um, had basically stockpiled huge amounts of aluminum prior to the aluminum tariffs uh, and are, are making out like bandits with the aluminum tariffs. Um, also that we're seeing uh, similar kinds of things with pencils. Uh, so. The reports on trade protection actually benefiting people who produce the products um, are not uh, clearly of, of one thing. So it would be interesting to see what people are taking out of all that. Thank you. Um, we have asked recently, as have a number of other uh, uh, pollsters, uh, about the tariffs. Uh, basically, the, the polls are all very consistent. Uh, a majority or a plurality of the public believe that these tariffs will be bad for the country, bad for the economy. Uh, 
And NBC actually asked a question where they uh, said, would you prefer to use tariffs to bolster uh, domestic industry, or are you afraid that that might uh, damage uh, relations with allies? And the American public said, no, we're more worried about it damaging relations with allies than bolstering U.S. industry. So um, what was uh, uh, maybe not surprising but very apparent in all of those surveys, and again, Fox has done it, NBC has done it, we've done it, CNN's done it, um, the partisan difference on those, if, if you are a supporter of the president, you overwhelmingly believe these tariffs are good for the country and you want to bolster American industry, and if you're an opponent of the president, you overwhelmingly think these tariffs are going to hurt the country and you'd rather, uh, uh, you're worried, more worried about uh, uh, relations with allies. So I do think we have to caution ourselves here that Again, you don't know what the respondent hears when you ask the question. When the question mentions Trump and tariffs, are they giving you an opinion about tariffs or are they giving you an opinion about Trump? Uh, and the, the polarization on this issue is just enormous, as it is on almost every issue in, in the American public, no matter what we ask them about. Uh, on your question about, about prices, I would... Uh, caution you, though, I mean, I think you're right. You ask people who are in export-oriented businesses, they're likely to say that this is, you know, this is uh, uh, good for them. Uh, but uh, this year, when we ask people, does trade increase or decrease prices, 56% of the public said it either increases prices or doesn't matter. So since economists say it certainly does matter, uh, you still have a majority of the public who don't buy the economist argument. So that's that's a, that's one of just a finding in the survey. Yeah. Uh, this question of uh, terrifying yeah. could be a T A R or <laughs> terrifying T E R. Uh, have any of the polls put the question as to are tariffs good or bad for the economy if they're designed to protect the industry? versus are tariffs uh, acceptable if they're designed to put pressure on outliers who uh, are engaging in unfair uh, uh, um, uh, trade practices? Um, because I think there's a question of whether it's Except terrifying or terrifying. Yeah. No, I, I, that's, a, that's a good, a good but, point. We don't, I don't know if anybody's asked it that way. Yeah, before you answer, <laughs> that, that's going to be the last question. We're starting to run out of time. And I would solicit an answer to, to that question, as well as any other kind of concluding remarks that each of you might have. Um, just, uh, I, I think even on the tariff question, there is a question, it's not, again, I would say just like with trade, tariffs aren't good or bad. If tariffs are designed and implemented properly to address an unfair trade practice or global excess capacity or mercantilist act, uh, actions on the part of a trading partner and they succeed, they're used in a strategic and surgical way, then uh, you know that's something which ultimately leads to a better outcome because it leads to a more efficient outcome because you know unfair trade practices are stopped. And so I I worry a little bit that you know in the current current climate that we not uh, demonize the whole concept of using tariffs. I don't think they're being used very strategically right now, and I don't think that they're. Um, you know, yielding a lot of benefits because uh, they're not done, being done in coordination with allies in a way that is likely to move the ball. But, um, but that's a different question from whether tariffs are just good or bad. Yeah, I, 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 I would just flag the, the issue of the sort of multilateral rules-based system uh, which we put in place largely at American insistence uh, in the post-war period precisely because history teaches us that unilateral uh, behavior on tariffs is ultimately counterproductive. It, it, it starts a, a downward spiral from which everyone ultimately loses. And it's, you know, it's, it's like devaluing your currency. Putting up a tariff is great if nobody else does the same thing. If you're the only one who does it, it may even give you a brief uh, advantage. But if everyone does it at the same time, everyone loses. If everyone starts to put tariffs up, then you're just, it cancels itself out. So I think that's our criticism with, with what is happening today. It's not that the, some of the issues which are being raised are not legitimate, particularly in relation to, to China. It's the, it's the risk of unilateralism spreading and then becoming a, a contagion that is ultimately damning to, to everyone uh, and without even achieving the, 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 the purpose which is, which is 
sought to be obtained. One, one final point in about the politicization of this issue and the partisanship on this issue, and it doesn't come from one survey we've done, but that Gallup has done con, uh, periodically since 1993, where they ask the American public, do you consider particular countries to be fair or unfair traders? And it probably will come as no surprise to many people here that in 1993, people thought Japan was an unfair trader. Today, the American public thinks Japan is a fair trader, Gallup didn't ask it about China in 1993 because I guess they didn't consider it relevant. Now, a majority of Americans say China's the unfair trader. Uh, but what is, to my mind, most interesting is that in 1993, overwhelmingly, the public said Canada was a fair trader. The percentage of Americans who say Canada is a fair trader has gone down dramatically, especially among Republicans. And I'll let you draw your own conclusion as to why that is. But I do think politics does matter in this context in terms of public opinion. Okay, well, as we close, I, I would like to relate an odd experience that I had yesterday. I flew from London Heathrow to Washington Dulles. Going to the airport, the traffic was very light. There was no line at the airport counter. There was no line at security. And the upshot was I ended up being ready to travel you know, much before my flight time. So I was walking to the gate and there was a giant liquor store. <laughs> so I, you know, I, I had some time to kill, so I walked in. And looking at, 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 the, at, the, at the bottles of whiskey on display, I saw that there was a bottle of whiskey that I enjoy drinking that seemed like it was a very low price. And it was very early in the morning. I hadn't any coffee, and I really was a little confused. So I got my phone out. I checked the exchange rate. And then I actually looked up the price that the same bottle was being sold for over on P Street. And indeed, I am here to attest that yesterday, one could purchase at, at Heathrow Airport a bottle of Connemara Irish whiskey for less than half the price that it's being sold on P Street. So I bought two bottles. Now, <laughs> I don't know if this reflects trade raising prices or lowering prices, or if this is an example of Thea's, you know, monopolists and retailers sucking up all the margin, or if it simply reflects a longstanding Nolan family tradition of attempting to evade liquor taxes. All I know is uh, I'm quite happy with my purchase, and given uh, events <laughs> elsewhere in the city uh, this afternoon, I may be digging in tonight when I get home. With that... Don't go with a second bottle. Just, yeah. just one. <laughs> <laughs> there may be other things to drink to later. <laughs> and with that, I declare the meeting adjourned. Please join me in, in, in congratulating our uh, speaker.